The government may have shut down, but the good news is we're still here. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. It is Tuesday. I am Matt Copenheffer, and right next to me is David the Mountie Hansen. David, that is a great looking hat you have on right now. Thank you. Yours why is are nice you, as well. Why are you wearing that? We, uh, we, ha we, ha we as the Motley Fool have launched Stock Advisor Canada, so we're, we're making our way up there. We're celebrating. We're celebrating. We are yes. celebrating the launch of Stock Advisor Canada. So you're, you've been So we're stereotyping you've been, you've been all Canadians. You have been complaining the entire time before we started filming about this hat. You're probably going to take it off halfway through the show. I'm not. Okay. You know why? Because I'm dedicated. Done. It's We're coming ready. off now. Yours is staying It's off. coming off already? <laughs> it's you done. Can, this is actually a very comfortable hat, and it keeps the light. <laughs> we got a great show today. Unfortunately, though, we have to start on a headline that I don't even want to talk about. This is Bloomberg. The headline is, Government Shutdown Begins as deadlock, Deadlocked Congress Flails. I'm just going to read a bit from the article. It says, Partial federal government shutdown would cost the U.S. at least... 300 million a day in lost economic output at the start, according to IHS. That's a fraction of the country's $15.7 trillion economy, and the effects would probably grow over time as consumers and businesses put off uh, purchases and, ex and in expansion plans. Uh, this is bad. I'm, I'm not investing based on a, a day's work in the economy, a day's But come on, this is, this, is, this is the government proving once again that... I, do they know what they're doing? What, what are they doing? I what is this? Is this middle school? They should know what they're doing. We elected them, but we're not going to get into the politics of it. Like I said, this is one day. Okay, it's shut down for one Maybe day. Maybe you elected them. How many, how many days are there in five years? Over th thousands of days here. This is not a big deal in the long run when you're investing for the long term. Do the math. Thousands of days in five years. We'll round down. <laughs> uh, one thing that I will note, note is that treasuries are up today. Mm -hmm. Corporates are down. Uh, we don't usually talk about bonds, but when we're talking about the federal government and the potential, I mean, the, the potential here is for this to roll right into that uh, debt ceiling talk. And it, it, it starts to get, I think it starts to get pretty serious once we get there because then you start talking about the, the government potentially defaulting on its obligations. And I mean, this is bad enough to me, but if we start getting to that point again, I. But treasuries are up. <laughs> Moving on. Treasuries are up, so so apparently there's not too much concern from uh, from the market quite Not yet. that surprising. Moving on. Headline. Second headline was from Bloomberg as well. Wells Fargo in 869 million, 69, not 870 million, being exact here. Not quite. Settlement with Freddie Mac. What a surprise, another big bank settling with a part of the government here. This time it's Wells Fargo. Has to deal I with. like that you refer to Freddie Mac as a part of the government. Well, they are part of the government, technically. They're not shut down. No. Having to do with mortgages that Wells Fargo sold before 2009, so all of the maybe shoddier stuff than what's being originated today. This is really, we talk about a drop in the bucket for J.P. Morgan uh, at $11 billion, not that big of a deal. This is nothing to Wells Fargo, and they already reserved against these legal losses and these fines, so this is not a big deal at all. But this is just Fargo. Freddie Mac. I mean, this is arguably the, the smaller portion of, of what's going to come back at Wells Fargo. I mean, does, does Wells Fargo just get a pass in all of this? It, it, they've flown under the radar. They've done, uh, the, the company did a lot of the same things that we saw. I mean, they wouldn't be set, making this kind of settlement if they didn't. But they essentially get a pass while Bank of America and J.P. Morgan make big headlines about the missteps that they had during the financial crisis and prior to. Well, you talk about Freddie Mac being a smaller one, which Freddie Mac is smaller than Fannie Mae, but when we, when we just look at where Wells Fargo sold its mortgages before 2009, they sold more to Freddie Mac than Fannie Mae. So this is actually the larger piece of the pie. And I, I would say, yes, they do get a pass on a lot of this stuff, and they all had problems with this, but Wells Fargo seem to be the most disciplined, as disciplined as there were, was disciplined back in 2006, 2007. So I really think they do get a pass here. All right, moving on to the third headline here. We've got deal book. The headline, the, this is a great headline, mergers holding steady. <laughs> <laughs> mergers holding steady is the headline. Third quarter ended. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. We talked about it a little bit last week. The third quarter came to a close. The league tables have closed out. Merger and acquisition activity. Goldman Sachs, the leader yet again. Not too much of a surprise there. J.P. Morgan, number two. And Bank of America, number three. And I think this is one of the unsung stories of the investment banking market is the, the strength that Bank of America has 
after having acquired Merrill Lynch, I was talking to a reporter yesterday about the, the merger, and five years later, the deal that was struck at the time still looks horrible. I mean, that, that is a deal that they shouldn't have done. Um, but if we take it from where the company is today, Merrill Lynch is a good asset to have. And, and, and I think this shows it right here because Bank of America did not have that strength in merger and acquisition advisory uh, before bringing on Merrill Lynch. And when you look at the tables, one big name that's not on there is Wells Fargo. And that's not really surprising because Wells Fargo has a pretty small investment bank compared to JP Morgan and Bank of America but they're not even on the table right now. And I know it's a very small part of their business now, but I really think that's a part of Wells Fargo that can be a growth driver in the next five to 10 years. I mean, they're really mm -hmm. the cross-selling king on the consumer world. As they get more corporate clients, I think they can potentially cross-sell in their investment banking services. So just a place I to don't, watch. I don't know, I don't know. Talking I, 10 I think years here. Maybe, maybe. I, I just, I don't think it's on their radar. I don't think it's on the company's radar. One, one final note that, that I will say, across the M&A advisory spectrum, so we think about some smaller M&A shops uh, like Lazard, like Evercore. It has not been an even market for, for advisory deals. There have been some big mega deals that have led to some bigger fees for some of the bigger banks and have led to big deal sizes. Mm -hmm. But the, the environment for smaller and mid-sized deals hasn't been quite as robust. Right. So a, a little bit tougher environment for those guys. All right, moving on to our next segment, looking at a couple more headlines. Rapid fire style. The first one was from AP. Walker and Dunlop plunges, never good to plunge, on loan outlook. This is a hot day and you're <laughs> jumping in a pool. True. Okay, so Walker and Dunlop, they're a commercial real estate lender that focuses on multifamily, so apartment complexes, and they originate their loans and sell most of them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. Those entities are hitting, getting close to their cap in terms of how much they can take on. So Walker and Dunlop came out and said, hey, look, our guidance is probably going to be, it's going to be 20% lower than what we thought it was going to be. So not a good day for the down, down around 15% uh, for the stock, but it's trading at about 10 times earnings right now. This isn't a stock that's priced for perfection. So I don't see this as a selling point here, maybe a buying opportunity. Tough day for investors, nevertheless. Uh, headline from Wall Street Journal, B of A whistleblower faces own email in hustle trial. So Bank of America is in this trial over Countrywide's hustle program, which was, the, the argument is that they were hustling through uh, mortgages that shouldn't have been put through, lower quality mortgages. The whistleblower here, though, was, was met with an email of, uh, uh, of his own that says, it was reassuring to see all the controls we've had in place over the years. Our exposure is to manufacturing quality, not fraud or unethical stuff. So this is kind of an interesting uh, def piece of defense mm -hmm. that uh, the Bank of America has now. The whistleblower at the time was saying that he didn't think that there was fraud or, or lack of ethical things going on there in this uh, issue. We'll see how it plays out. All right, next headline is from the New York Times. Coming soon, an Occupy Wall Street debit card. This is interesting. Occupy Wall Street has a debit card now, and they're partnering everywhere with, you want to be. They're partnering with Visa. And one of the quotes from the article was, the group had no choice but to do business with a company or a similar one in order to produce a debit card that could be widely accepted. I think this just highlights MasterCard and Visa. They're really the only game in town for a lot of these upstarts in trying to get a card you can out see on an the market. American Express Occupy Wall Street card? Come that would, on. That would be interesting. With with the with the Roman with the Roman guy on there? It, I don't think it's Charged. I don't think it's a done deal yet, but I thought it was interesting that <laughs> they're partnering with Visa here. Or PayPal? The next headline is from New York Times and it's Occupy, you stole my headline. It's, it's also the Occupy Wall Street debit card. You stole my headline. Here's, here's the quote that I picked out from it that I like. It's not quite as serious as what you were talking about. The group's website, website invites visitors to join the revolution, suggesting that using the card might represent a protest with every purchase. Maybe it's just me, but I prefer points or cash back <laughs> with every purchase, but... You can't That's redeem your protest just, for, for flights? I, maybe you can. One maybe day. you can redeem, you, 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 you score all of the little protests and you can cash them in for a big protest. Okay. I, don't, I don't know how that works. All right, moving on to the in focus for the day. Last week I wrote an article that looked at a common rule of thumb mm -hmm. that, that a lot of investors tend to talk about if not use when investing in bank stocks. And that rule of thumb uses book, uh, 
price to book value mm -hmm. as the as the measuring stick for bank stocks. And, and the, the rule of thumb is buy below book value, sell above twice book value. So what I wanted to do is go back and look to see if that actually yeah. works. So I think we've got a couple charts from uh, the article. And the first one shows what the actual performance was. This is of, of, of all the stocks. So the S&P 500, this is between 2003 and 2013, so you've got a decade there. S&P 500, the top 10 largest banks, and then the top 50 largest banks, and obviously the banks trailed the S&P pretty considerably. So what happens when we apply the, the one, buy below one, sell above two, book value guidance, here's what we get. It is still pretty bad. So the, the top 10 banks, you've now got a profit. But the top 50 banks, you've got an even larger loss. So you didn't exactly shoot out the lights when you mm -hmm. applied that. In, in fact, you probably wouldn't want to do that because we've, we've got a bigger uh, sample size with the 50 banks, mm -hmm. and you've got a bigger loss there. Right. So the next thing I did was I thought about what are the other simple things that we could add to this rule of thumb that, that look at this. And one of the things I thought about as I was going through is that when you are buying below book value, you are, you're essentially going to get some of the banks that are the most in trouble. Mm -hmm. So Wells Fargo, which navigated the, the financial crisis pretty well, or very well, depending on how you look at it, you never would have bought Wells Fargo if you were just buying banks below book value. U.S. Bank Corp, similar situation, never would have bought it. And, uh, and, and meanwhile, you would have been buying a bank like Citigroup just as it was hitting the worst of the time. So it, the stock, the, the valuation on the stock, went below book value just really at the worst time to mm -hmm. own Citigroup. So, so you would have not owned the best banks and owned some of the weakest banks at the worst times. So what I did was added to it uh, an, another uh, aspect, and this is the effective return. So, so what you do is you take the return on equity and you divide it by the price to tangible book value. So you're relating returns and valuation all in one little metric here. And so I combined the two and I said, what if you only bought below one times book value when you had this 5% effective return mm -hmm. and then sold when you were above two? And obviously you can see the returns were a heck of mm -hmm. a lot better. The problem is, is that you didn't have a very big sample size here. There were only a few banks that you would have end up, ended up buying and you would have had to do a lot of weird buying, quick buying and selling, which isn't really our mm -hmm. style. So I wanted to simplify it a little bit more. So all I did was look at that effective return. So, so I forgot about the rule of the, the one to two times book value mm -hmm. rule of thumb altogether. And I said, what would it look like if it was just this effective return of 5% or better? And here's what we get. So obviously, this with the top 10 banks, it looks very good. Mm -hmm. With the top 50 banks, it doesn't look all that good. You're still taking a loss. However, what I will put, point out is that loss is better than just buying all of the top 50 banks. It's also much better than using the first rule mm -hmm. of thumb that we started with. So what I came away with was essentially using this 5% effective return as sort of a benchmark of as you're looking through bank stocks, it kind of uh, winnows down the universe a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you can start your, your search from the banks that actually are, have that um, mm -hmm. characteristic. And today, interestingly enough, you can find tons of, of banks out there that have a 5% uh, effective uh, return to investors mm -hmm. or much better. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, you, when you look at, sorry, when, when you look at, <laughs> I know I've been going on here, but when you look at even Wells Fargo and U.S. Bancorp today, uh, you can get uh, returns, uh, effective returns that are close mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, I think that's one of the most common mistakes when someone's looking at a bank is just to say, well, it's below book value, it's guaranteed to buy, but mm -hmm. you have to ask, okay, why is it below book value? Is the long-term earnings potential damaged or will it eventually go back to 15% return on equity? In that case, then it probably is a good buy. And the, I think the reason people get confused by that or hung up on that is because a lot of times when we look at other companies, consumer-facing companies, tech companies, you look at the P.E. ratio, and that's kind of the, the standard in terms of valuation. When you look over at banks, you're looking more at book value. And it's the same thing. If you looked at a company that had a P.E. A PE ratio of 10, mm -hmm. you'd be like, well, that looks really cheap. Right. But if they've been declining in earnings... Or if they're unprofitable. Or if they're unprofitable, you would ask, well, why, why should I pay anything well, I guess for if, these if they're unprofitable, Sorry, if they're unprofitable, you're not getting a PE of 10. But anyway. Then they're Amazon. But um, <laughs> Either way, so you really can't just look at this one metric and say, cheap equals buy. Yeah. And I think that's 
you make a great point in terms of you have to look at the performance. And one of the analysts downstairs that works on Inside Value, one of the services that really prides themselves on buying value cheap stocks, he says, well, well yeah, the metric doesn't mean anything if the long term earnings potential is not there for the company. Sure, sure. All right, moving on from there to our game for today, we've got a little bit of would you rather? And this is, this is simple, there's just a couple questions, a few questions here, and it's would you rather X or Y? Pretty simple. And by the way, you may have, uh, I'm wearing this hat, as I said at the beginning, to celebrate the launch of Stock Advisor Canada. You took yours off, that may have been a good decision. <laughs> this is a really, a little toasty? It's, it's a really warm <laughs> hat, it is a really, I mean, I can see that if I was in cold weather, if it was snowing out, this would be excellent. It's, it's not quite great here. All right, starting out, name three stocks that you would rather own than Wells Fargo right now. Okay. Um, don't dislike Wells, Wells Fargo as a stock. I'm not a shareholder. I'll mend that. Oh, three companies you'd rather three own. Companies. Let's talk Come about on. companies, not stocks. Uh, right off the top, I'll go PNC, JP Morgan, to which I, I happen to own them. Okay. And the third one, I will go with Bank of America. So looking ac across the board, Bank of America, JP Morgan, PNC, all of their returns, their returns on equity, lag, lag behind Wells Fargo mm -hmm. for now. In the long term, over the next 10 years. In terms JP of, Morgan, not by that much, though. Not by that much. Not quite to the level of Wells Fargo, though. Mm -hmm. The other two, a little bit more significantly yeah. behind, especially Bank of America. But over the long term, I see the profit engines being pretty similar at all four of those banks, and the valuations look a little bit more attractive at the other. Wow, that's bold. You, th you think Bank of America's returns can approach the level of Wells Fargo's? Eventually. <sighs> Talking five, 10 years. That is, that is what bold. Do you say? My, my three are AIG. Huntington Bank shares and JP Morgan. So I've got JP Morgan, I share that with you. Huntington Bank, this is, this is one that I've said it time and again, I should own it, don't own it yet. I think th there's a great management team in there and I think they've got a great customer focus, which in the banking industry, you just don't find that quite enough that uh, uh, the company's really thinking about what do the customers need, how do we serve the customers. AIG, return to the core businesses, those are reasonable core, core businesses to own and the valuation is still mm -hmm. very, very cheap. So that's why, that's the reasoning there. Next, couple rapid fire, uh, would you rather, here, would you rather own PNC or Regions Financial? PNC. Would you rather own Bank of America or JP Morgan? JP Morgan. Why JP Morgan? Um, the history, the, the history of the bank in terms of managing through the crisis and you can make the argument, well, a lot of those people aren't there anymore. A lot of them left after the London Whale uh, I incident. But I think the culture at JP Morgan is stronger than Bank of America. I think the services are similar. I think the returns at JP Morgan will just be a little bit Okay, better. good enough. AIG, would you rather own AIG or Travelers? Mm, tough one, but I'll go with AIG. I'm sure you're probably going to say, say the same thing. I'm going to say sure. I'm going to say AIG. AIG for the reasons that you just said, so I'll save, you the, save the breath. Yeah, I'm going to say AIG. Going back backwards to forwards, I'm going to say AIG. I'm going to say, ah, oh, that's a tough one. I'll say JP Morgan over Bank of America. Um, the, the returns are there today, and the valuation is still pretty low. You don't have to bank on something happening mm -hmm. I internally at JP Morgan to change things. And then I will say PNC over Regions Financial. What's interesting is I think those valuations are getting very, very close yep. to each other, and I think PNC is a better business overall. And finally, Last would you rather. Would you rather work in the Markel investing department with Tom Gaynor? So actually working in the Markel investing department with legendary investor Tom Gaynor, or just get to follow Warren Buffett around all day, everything that he does. You don't get to work with him. You don't get to do anything. You just follow him around, dead silent. You can't say a word. Just follow him around. I'd follow Buffett. him around. I'd follow Buffett. You'd follow what you, Buffett. What do you say? I'd like to work with Tom Gaynor. Okay, fair enough. I'd like to work with Tom Gaynor. Also, and I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to be pessimistic here, but the following around Warren Buffett probably wouldn't last as long as getting to work with Tom Gaynor. I'm just saying. I actually have one more. Would you rather for you? Oh, hit me. One more. We'll throw it up on the screen. All right, here. you're surprising me. Here. All right. Would you rather discuss the government <laughs> shutdown, debate Obamacare? Examine J.P. Morgan's legal woe some more, <laughs> or just stub your toe. Which one you, would you pick on this? You are trying to kill me here. You Which were... one do you want? Look, they're all great options. I, I'm, I'm a runner. I'm a runner. 
and I'm not gonna get too, too gross here, but what happens when you run long distances is you bash your toes against your, against your shoes over and over again and you lose toenails. So you'd rather stub your toe. I would much rather stub my toe. That is no big deal. Talking about any of those, dreadfully painful. I agree. I'm if I had to pick one of those, I'd probably talk about JP Morgan because that's the least distasteful. At least it has something to do with something I'm interested in. Fair enough. All right, moving on to the final <sighs> segment. On the Twitter sphere. Now I have indigestion. <laughs> First tweet we're looking at is from our own Jason Moser. Moser. He says, headline drill, what's the one stock you already own that you'd love to see get cut in half today just so you could buy more? Hashtag invest better. Thoughts? What do you want to fall 50%? Either Berkshire Hathaway or Markel. E either one of those, I would feel very comfortable. It, obviously, you'd want to see the details of why it's falling 50%, but Almost certainly, I would feel comfortable just saying, I'm buying a ton. Oh, so we're saying that there's something that happened. That well, come on, there's got to be some. If the entire market <laughs> fell 50% and all stocks fell uniformly 50% and this was just a big market movement, yeah, easy, no, no brainer. But if, if the stock itself, apart from everything else, is falling, there's got to be some reason, right? Fair enough. Do you want Wait. me to give one? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, if there's a reason, I was going to say Goldman Sachs, but if Goldman was down 50%, I would be a little bit scared that something pretty drastic happened there. But if it was just a market downturn 50% and Goldman was 50% off from today, I would absolutely be buying more. All right, second tweet here. We've got Jeremy Markovich. That's at Defly in Ain. The tweet is, BB&T now has more branches around Charlotte than Bank of America. In its own backyard. BB&T just... Brutal. What, what, what do you make of this? Is this, so is this good news for BB&T, bad news, what is it more? Good news for BB&T, bad news for Bank of America, or good news for Bank of America? I think, it's, I think it's good news for Bank of America. I think this makes total sense. They had too big of a footprint. We're moving away from physical branches. And, and this data comes from the FDIC. They put out all these all this data on deposits and branches. I'm sure everyone's gonna go out and pour through all it's this good data. Reading. It's very exciting. A couple uh, just tidbits from that. Bank of America and Capital One both reduced their branch size by around 5% year over year. Mm -hmm. JP Morgan increased the number of branches they had. Uh, Bank of America's deposits were only up around 1%. Wells Fargo and JP Morgan up around 10%. So just some interesting dynamics there. Interesting. All right, going out to our last tweet. Last tweet of the day from Downtown Josh Brown at Reform Broker. Can someone please write another blog post about how stocks traded during the 1995 government shutdown? Thanks. Matt, I know you already wrote yours, right? It's, challenge, it's waiting to be published. Challenge accepted. <laughs> are you, are you going to write something? I'm doing a, like a 20 minute video on it. God, I, can't, it. I cannot wait until this is over. I cannot wait until this is over. This is such a distraction. And I, and I hope that foolish investors watching this, I mean, gr granted, it's, it's not nothing. The, the government's got to get it together, but from an investing perspective, I think it's largely distraction, and I know you agree with that. I somehow agree with that. All right, folks, that is our show for today. You can follow us and tweet at us at TMF Financials. You can also find us on Facebook, Motley Fool Financials. Thanks for watching. We will see you tomorrow.